I want to tell you a little bit about the kinds of people, or rather some of the characteristics that displease God. The proud Pharisee. Imagine a Pharisee who stood in the temple, boasting of his righteousness and looking down on others. In Luke 18, verse 9 to 14, Jesus shared the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. While the Pharisee exalted himself, the tax collector humbly sought God's mercy. Just as the proud Pharisee's heart was far from God, arrogance and self-righteousness are attitudes God detests. The unforgiving servant. Think of a servant who received great forgiveness from his master, but refused to forgive a fellow servant's debt. In Matthew 18, verse 21 to 35, Jesus told the parable of the unforgiving servant, highlighting the importance of extending forgiveness as we've been forgiven. Just as the unforgiving servant's heart was consumed by bitterness, harboring unforgiveness goes against the heart of God. The hypocrite. Envision a person who wears a mask of piety in public, but lives a different life behind closed doors. In Matthew 23, Jesus confronted the religious leaders' hypocrisy, denouncing their outward righteousness while neglecting justice, mercy, and humility. Just as the hypocrite's actions betray their true heart, God despises hypocrisy that contradicts genuine faith. The heart of injustice. Consider a person who exploits the vulnerable, oppresses the weak, and disregards justice. In Amos 5, verse 21 to 24, God rebuked the Israelites for their empty religious rituals while perpetuating injustice. He desires a heart that seeks righteousness and upholds justice. Just as God condemns oppression and neglect of the marginalized, a heart lacking compassion and justice displeases him. While God's word does address actions he detests, it also reveals he does want and call for us to renew our hearts and minds through his word. In addition, when you yield to the Holy Spirit, this leads to not only a transformed heart, but characteristics such as humility, forgiveness, and compassion. Now, I encourage you to pay close attention to the following story, a story that we can all learn from when it comes to the serious consequences of doing what displeases God. The story of Esau teaches us the dangers of having a lack of self-control. It teaches us about how we can place ourselves in eternal jeopardy over a moment, a single moment of sin and selfish pleasure. So how bad was the sin that Esau committed? Well, let's go right into the beginning of time when God makes a promise in the book of Genesis to Adam and Eve. He promises that through Adam and Eve's family line, a man will come who will defeat Satan and death. After Adam and Eve, along came a man named Abraham, and the same promise was given. The problem is that Abraham and his wife were very old and unable to have kids. Despite that, later in life, God gives them a son named Isaac. Isaac ends up having twin sons. The oldest name is Esau, and the younger is Jacob. According to Jewish culture, Esau should have the birthright, and the promise to save humanity through his offspring should be passed down. However, due to his desire of the flesh and lack of care for the promises of God, he loses the opportunity to be the one by which the promise of God would be fulfilled. We can most clearly see the heart of Esau in Genesis 25, 29 through 34. It says, Once when Jacob was cooking stew, Esau came in from the field and he was exhausted. And Esau said to Jacob, Let me eat some of that red stew, for I am exhausted. Therefore his name was called Edom. Jacob said, Sell me your birthright now. Esau said, I am about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? Jacob said, Swear to me now. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, 
and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. This was incredibly significant and equally a careless thing for Esau to do because the promise of God to save the world would be fulfilled through the son who had the birthright. Not only that, but he would be the one in charge of the family. This was a great honor to have at this time in history. However, we see that Esau is indifferent when it comes to this birthright. After a long day of work, Esau is tired and hungry. He has the ability to cook his own food and has access to clean water, yet he wants to feed his desire right now instead of simply waiting. He asks for some red stew from his brother. When the words red stew are translated from Hebrew, it can literally be translated as red red. This shows us that the stew was not anything fancy or over the top. The author does not even know what is in the stew. It is a simple red stew. His brother Jacob was ready to capitalize on any situation. So instead of just giving his brother a bowl of stew, he offers him a deal. For a bowl of stew, Esau is to give up his birthright. That means, after the death of their father, Jacob would then be in charge. He would inherit everything, including the promise of an offspring that would save the world and defeat Satan. That promise would be transferred from Esau to Jacob. Esau does not think twice about it. Esau didn't care about inheritance. Esau was all about self-gratification, so he traded his birthright for the stew and then simply went on his way. Imagine that. The birthright was customarily passed down from father to eldest son, yet he despised his inheritance. He left and did not care about his birthright. He wasn't concerned about the blessing of God one bit. His focus is to fulfill his own desire. We see a little deeper into Esau's heart in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews 12, verse 15 to 17 says, See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. The Amplified translation paints a better picture of Esau's remorse when he realized what he had done. The Bible says, and see to it that no one is immoral or godless like Esau, who sold his own birthright for a single meal. For you know that later on, when he wanted to regain title to, his inheritance of the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no opportunity for repentance. There was no way to repair what he had done, no chance to recall the choice he had made even though he sought for it with bitter tears. When Esau did not care at the time that he was selling away his birthright, he would later go on to regret it immensely. And we should learn from this. While the desires of the flesh look good at the moment, they lead to regret and brokenness in the end. C.S. Lewis put it best when he said, we are half-hearted creatures, fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us. Like an arrogant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. Esau was given the opportunity of a lifetime to be the one that the blessing of God would come through, but traded it all for a bowl of stew. He traded the vacation by the sea for mud pies in the backyard. 
The story of Esau is a warning to us. While it may be easy to live life with a lack of self-control, this will lead to missing out on the blessings of God. Just because something looks good and right in the moment does not mean we should take it as it may lead us away from God. While the desires of the flesh satisfy now, they will lead to a life without the blessing of God. Instead, God calls us to be people of self-control. We do not have to give in to every desire we have as we have something greater waiting for us. This was not the only time Esau gave into the desires of the flesh. We see it happen over and over. Imagine what would have happened if Esau had not given in to his desires. The offspring that would come and defeat sin and Satan, whose name is Jesus, would have come through the line of Esau. Instead of writing songs about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, it would be the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. The same is true to some extent in our life. We are missing the blessing of God by giving in to the desires of the flesh. While the flesh tells us that pornography, sleeping with others outside of marriage, giving in to anger all the time, and gossiping behind each other's back feels good, it will end up leading to destruction. This very sin may even lead to you missing the blessing of God. Let us not become people like Esau who give in to every evil desire. One of the most notorious groups of people in the Bible are the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Although they failed in their objectives, these people worked to discredit Jesus. They schemed against our Lord. They were always in the corners and in and amongst the crowds, watching, listening, waiting, all with the hope of catching Jesus out when it came to some religious issue or certain theology. But before we dive in and take a look at why this group of people was so dangerous, there's a few things you have to understand. When we think of running away from God, we often think of someone running away by doing bad things. People run away from God in very different ways. They do this through sin and disobedience, and it's in their sin of committing adultery, stealing, or gossiping about others, or whatever it may be. It's in doing these things that they run away from the Lord. While all of this is true, there is an equally dangerous way to run away from God that we often overlook. And that is running away from God by doing good things and thinking we are better than those around us. Now, we can believe that we have earned the favor of God by doing good things, but this is not how God works. No one can earn the favor of God. No one can earn mercy. No one can earn a blessing. All of these things are freely given to us by the Lord because of His great love. For anyone who thinks they can earn God's favor or love because of the things they do, this is called self-righteousness. Self-righteous people are less concerned about their hearts and what God sees and more about how others view their actions. Let's take a look at the most self-righteous groups in the Bible, the Pharisees and Sadducees. In the book of Matthew, we see Jesus rebuke the Pharisees and Sadducees for their self-righteous behavior. Matthew 6 verse 5 says, And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. In Greek culture, a hypocrite was an actor in a play. They would have many different roles in a play. In one scene, they would come out in a green mask. Then in the next scene, they would play a different role and come out in a red mask. They were constantly changing their roles depending on the scene. Jesus says that the Pharisees and Sadducees do the same thing. They play different roles in front of people depending on the audience they have in front of them. In today's culture, we would find it strange for someone to stand on the street and start praying. However, when Jesus was on this earth, the Pharisees and Sadducees would be perceived as extremely holy for doing such a thing. 
However, Jesus tells the hypocrites that their motives are off. True holiness is not praying so that others would hear you, but praying in order to have a relationship with your heavenly Father. The hypocrites will not receive the reward of a relationship with God because their reward is others listening to them. One of the most significant problems with the Pharisees and Sadducees was that they did not see themselves as people needing God's grace. Luke 18 illustrates this well. Luke 18, 10 to 14 says, two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. In this story, the Pharisee prayed a very self-righteous prayer. Instead of thanking God for the mercy and grace in his life that has made him a righteous man, he saw the sin in others. Instead of going to God seeking mercy, he goes on to talk about how perfect he thinks he is. This Pharisee talked about all the great things he thinks he has done. However, the tax collector, he knew he was a sinner and undeserving of God's love and mercy. He knew that he needed to be forgiven and he called out for mercy. Jesus teaches that true purity, holiness, and righteousness do not come from our actions. It comes from the grace and mercy that Jesus gives us. The Pharisee's pride blocked him from seeing his need for mercy. He was righteous in his own eyes. However, the tax collector was justified because he recognized his need for the mercy of God. He was righteous because God made him righteous through his confession. The difference between self-righteousness and righteousness really comes down to motive. The self-righteous, such as the Pharisees and Sadducees, do good things in order to be seen by others. There's always an agenda. Those who are self-righteous want to look good in the public eye. Even deeper than that, they often think that the good things they do earn favor with God. We often see this today in the prosperity movement. Many in this movement think that because they have followed the rules of God, they have earned the favor of God for protection from the sickness and brokenness of the world. While the action is good, the motive is off. However, those who are truly righteous do good out of the love for God. They have a true purity, holiness, and righteousness. They know there's nothing they can ever do to earn the love of God. They have sin rooted deep in their heart. However, they confess that to God and know that God has made a way to take that sin away through Jesus Christ. Then due to that love, they follow the commands of God. Not so they can be seen by others, but because God's grace and mercy runs deep for them. Sometimes it's good for us to reflect and examine our hearts. Here are a few questions to ask yourself to see if you are self-righteous or truly righteous. When you do good things, such as go to church, help out a neighbor, or give money, do you do that so others will see? Do you feel that the good things you do earn you love and favor from God? Do you think that you're better than the people around you? If you find that you are self-righteous, the great news is that there is a way forward. While the Pharisees and Sadducees get a bad rap, they were not all self-righteous. In the book of John, there is a Pharisee named Nicodemus who came to Jesus in secret because he did not want any of his fellow Pharisees to see him coming to Jesus. He was afraid of man. But by the end of the book of John, you see a complete change in Nicodemus. 
He takes the body of Jesus down from the cross after the crucifixion and prepares it for burial. He goes from worrying about what other men will think, which is self-righteous, to worrying about what God thinks, which is true righteousness. If the heart of a man can be changed from one of the most self-righteous groups ever to walk the face of the earth, he can also change your heart. Just as the tax collector in Luke 18 came before the Lord beating his chest and asking for mercy, you do the same.